Thank you, Fariza. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. We are late, so I'm going to start straight away. Um, also, I'm very jet lagged, so I want to get this over and done with. Um, we've seen from the morning sessions that uh, understandings of liberalism uh, throughout the world, and especially in Malaysia, are diverse, often confusing, sometimes disturbing. Uh, I don't want to go through the political philosophy all over again because I think the earlier speakers uh, went, went through some of that. But for me, it was the British classical tradition that provided um, one framework for me to understand liberalism. But as, as I've discovered since, uh, by no means does the British classical liberal tradition have a monopoly um, over it. The values of classical liberalism have appeared repeatedly in civilizations across space and time. Inspiration has come from ancient civilizations and the beliefs of the world's religions. Indeed, there is a think tank called uh, the Minaret of Freedom in, in the US that is dedicated to expounding libertarianism in Islam, drawing heavily from the writings of Ibn Khaldun and other thinkers of the Muslim golden age. And having worked and interacted with legislative and international organizations in the UK, continental Europe, and the United States, I appreciated how differently even the proponents of liberalism define it too. Uh, and since I returned to Malaysia in 2008, um, and having traveled throughout the ASEAN region, I've realized that the word liberalism is probably the most elastic in all of political philosophy. And certainly in Malaysia, the word has been completely redefined over time to suit political objectives. In a speech in May last year, the Prime Minister said that Muslims face a new threat, human rightism, where the core beliefs are based on humanism and secularism as well as liberalism. In June this year, former Prime Minister uh, Mahathir Muhammad said that liberalism has resulted in a lot of Muslims in Britain joining ISIS and slaughtering people. <laughs> and so in my engagements with young Malaysians throughout the years, I have tried to remind people that the values that ideas is promoting, our four principles which lie at the heart of classical liberalism, have cropped up repeatedly in our history. Now it would of course be wrong and a, and a, a great exaggeration to say we were always liberal. But there was clearly a narrative, one that led our proclamation of indep independence to espouse liberty and justice. And the speeches and articles of the father of independence made it clear that he held classical liberal values. And indeed, we have compiled them in a pamphlet available on our website. Our Rukun Nagara, or National Principles, proclaimed in 1970, refers to the ambition of guaranteeing a liberal approach towards our rich and varied cultural traditions. Even the Vision 2020 of Dr. Mahadeh is explicit in calling for a matured, liberal, and tolerant society. And yet there exists in parallel a strong counter-narrative that seeks to deliberately forget, or worse, deliberately contort what this means, motivated entirely by political expediency. One favorite tactic is to appeal to class, race, or religion, such as in Asian values or the Islamic way of life, such that these become defined by the state instead of by individuals. And this enables the state to offer protection to these groups, leading to paternalism, authoritarianism, and the politics of patronage that inevitably spirals into corruption. Enemies such as the bourgeoisie, the Jews, or the Chinese, are similarly constructed to further reinforce this paradigm. Because, of course, defense mechanisms in the forms of various policies are necessary to continue this protection. It is a familiar story wherever, wherever class warfare, religious bigotry, or racial supremacy becomes institutionalized. To promote the idea of individual liberty in such a society, therefore, is a challenge to the powers that be because it undermines the logic of government-defined group identity that justifies policies aimed at those groups. If necessary, liberal ideas are branded as alien and heretical um, uh, concepts, and new justifications are dreamt up to consolidate state-sponsored division. Indeed, in the aftermath of the Malaysia Day Red Shirts rally, one politician from the governing party attempted to argue that there is an acceptable Islamic form of racism. 
The adoption of such rhetoric, coupled with the vilification of liberalism, highlights how malleable our political landscape is, how bereft it is of ideological conviction. Worse still, there can be political rewards for anti-liberal measures. Despite clear promises to repeal the Sedition Act, the Prime Minister announced a complete U-turn at his party's General Assembly and was cheered for it. There have even been calls for the 1948, oh no, sorry, 1960, uh, uh, the, the Internal Security Act, which allowed for detention without trial to be reinstated after its replacement in 2012. In the lecture series I have been delivering throughout the year, I have spoken repeatedly of going back to our constitution and the intentions of our founding fathers to repair key institutions like parliament, the judiciary, the police, the electoral commission, and others. We are lucky to have well-articulated points of reference to do this. But that process of institutional healing, while already arduous, must be joined by a more long-term resilient solution, which is to reclaim our indigenous narrative of freedom and put it, put it at heart of our conception of Malaysian democracy. This year, the United Kingdom celebrated the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, an agreement that explicitly limited the absolute power of the monarch. Even though it was not conceived at the time as a step towards a constitutional democracy, it is now regarded as a vital moment in the conception of the British state. But we in Malaysia also can point to moments in our history that, con that can provide the same inspiration. One is the agreement between Demang uh, Lebadaun and Sangsapurba, which established a contract between the ruler and the ruled, as well as the Batu Bersurat Tranganu of 1303, which required the ruler to act in accordance with a higher power. The next few centuries saw a rich tradition of lawmaking, especially in Malacca and Kedah, as the increasingly prosperous sultanates demanded that citizens and traders enjoyed security and justice. The Federation of Negrismilan shows us that traditional institutions from Pagaruyo, the matrilineal clan structure, decentralized governance, and adat courts could be adapted to a new geography. The Johor Constitution of 1895 and the Tringanu Constitution of 1911 show us that rulers were aware of the importance of separation of powers and limits to the authority of institutions. And while the Reed Commission looked to the Westminster model in the writing of our constitution, there is no doubt that history, uh, local history played, played its part. The rulers and political leaders involved in the Medeca negotiations would not have accepted a paradigm that was alien to what the people were used to, and after all, that lay at the crux of the rejection of the Malayan Union. In a sense, the 1948 Federation of Malaya Settlement, the 1957 Merdeka Agreement, and the 1963 Formation of Malaysia were echoes of the 1773 Federation of Negris Milan, different institutions with different histories fusing together in an attempt to create modern sovereign states in the Westphalian system. Now, in the economic sphere, it is even easier to point to past liberal policies. Every Malaysian knows that the Sultanate of Malacca was a thriving polity that was founded upon trade, and economic historians have shown that its comparatively low taxes were a main factor for its success. Apparently, no more than 8% of customs duties were charged on any ships leaving or entering Malacca, and this was a huge incentive for them to visit Malacca, and was also a testament to the trade attractive conditions created by the rulers of Malacca. And while Malacca's success was genuinely exceptional, even Malaysians forget that there were polities before and after that used similar methods to achieve economic prosperity. Another uh, not well-known economic policy tool favored by the Sultanate of Johor in the 19th century was the Kangchu system. This essentially created autonomous zones where author authorization letters were issued by the political rulers to heads of clans selected internally with the mandate to develop plantations. And the economic growth that resulted played a key part in the creation of the modern state of Johor. And I would venture to suggest also uh, uh, has a role to play in this concept today of Bangsa Johor. And today, of course, the language of Malaysia needing an open economy and the centrality of the Straits of Malacca harks back directly to some of this history. In what seems an amazing speech in 1993, Dr. Mahathir actually said, open quote, 
Perhaps the paradigm shift towards open regionalism, espoused by many liberal thinkers in the East and West, is what is needed to spur freer and greater world trade and stimulate investments. And the economic and other malaises that affect both Europe and the United States can and should be remedied through harnessing the East Asian economic engines and through greater openness, greater liberalism and greater free competition. The government will continue to encourage greater private investment initiatives while ensuring that the public sector does not crowd out activities in the commercial and business sectors. Necessary support will be provided to strengthen and enhance the role of the private sector. The tax system will be continuously reviewed to enhance its competitiveness. While bearing in mind the need to increase its sources of revenue, the government will continue its liberal tax policies in order to encourage private investment. Recognizing the critical role of direct foreign investment in terms of new technology, creation of employment and industrial linkages in the domestic economy, the current liberal policies towards foreign investment will be maintained." Close quote. And in case you weren't counting, Dr. Mahadeh said liberal or liberalism four times in that excerpt alone. The current Prime Minister has also spoken of liberalization in the economy. But many of the positive aims of his new economic model were watered down or even contradicted by later policies in response to key, uh, in response from key uh, voters. But some liberal rhetoric survives in relation to free trade efforts such as the ASEAN Economic Community or the Trans-Pacific Partnership and in language designed to attract international investors. But as some international investors and commentators have observed, government assurances are not enough. Rather, improvements in governance, such as ensuring the rule of law, fostering transparency, and reducing avenues for corruption are also needed. In this regard, the many league tables that rank countries on such indicators can act as a useful incentive. But at the same time, foreign policy objectives can run counter to the strengthening of liberal democratic institutions too, such as when certain information is withheld or used as blackmail against other countries' leaders. Finally, in social life, the transformation since Merdeka has been remarkable. Most people in this room might know the movies of Piramli, which uh, chronicle this phenomenon very well, but also look at the photographs and journals of schools, universities, and even public institutions, and you'll get a sense of how things have changed. Entire art forms like the Bangsawan or the Menorah dance have been erased from public consciousness, and the depiction of human and animal forms in art is now frowned upon. Tunku Abdul Rahman clearly saw what was happening, saying, in the old days people never bothered about what others did, so long as they were free to do what they liked themselves. And perhaps a reference back to what um, was said, um, this, the upper uh, attitude. Uh, today one cannot sneeze without being corrected, let alone, let alone enjoy oneself. That's what politics has done to our society. So that's what, that's what the Tunku was warning uh, in, the, in the 80s. Um, and when it comes to um, religion, um, uh, I was thinking about this during the second session in the morning. Uh, I think many Malaysians have forgotten, that even during part last time, uh, we signed the Aman Declaration, um, which, uh, which held that, which recognized the legitimacy of all the different mashabs, or well, not all, but uh, many of the different mashabs and, and, and said it's, it's not, not right to say that uh, these people are not Muslim. And yet here we are, uh, a few years later, uh, with all the anti-Shia rhetoric uh, around. I would also remind Malaysians that in the 70s, we hosted um, a Shia uh, in our national mosque. The Shah of Iran had a state visit to Malaysia, uh, and I think that's worth remembering as well. So ladies and gentlemen, despite this transformation, there are still remnants of our liberal narrative still surviving, even as the word liberal itself has been subjected to pariah status in favor of formulations like Hadari, moderation, Wasatia, and One Malaysia. And even that invocation is more to do with political expediency rather than ideological conviction, it still means that the political classes believe that these reson ideas resonate with many citizens. It is up to us to ensure that they resonate ever more strongly in these tough times. I will conclude with a quote from the first young Dipatuan Agong, Twanku Abdul Rahman. In the first royal address to parliament on the 12th of September 1959, His Majesty said, open quote, this constitution is the guardian of the rule of law. It protects the integrity, the freedom from influence, and the independence 
of our courts and our judges and our law officers and the members of our various commissions and of the, of the public service, responsible for appointments and discipline. In this way, it ensures the security, integrity and impartiality of the civil service. The constitution belongs to all of us. It belongs to us as the young Diputan Agung. It belongs to you as the members of parliament. It belongs to the people as the fount of power. We wish all our subjects on this historic day to know and understand that the constitution of the Federation of Malaya, our charter of rights and liberties, is now finally and completely in operation. And with the establishment of this parliament under the constitution, a new era begins for our nation. We urge you to always to remember that you are the representatives of all the people without exception and that what you do here shall be done for the benefit of all the people. We urge you to conduct your affairs in such a way that the Parliament of Malaya will be a shining beacon of democracy at its brightest and best. We are sure that throughout the free world where parliamentary institutions are the guardians of democracy, the future of this Parliament will be followed with keen interest and goodwill. It is our earnest hope and desire that however hard your feelings may be on any particular subject or matter which is brought up in this house for discussion, that you will adhere strictly to the standing orders and to the principles of parliamentary democracy." Close quote. And earlier uh, in the second session, Patricia spoke of this quote, let, he, let him who is without sin uh, stand up uh, and cast the first stone. Well, I think something else that many Malaysians might not be aware of is that Tunku Abdul Rahman in Parliament said this exact same thing uh, one, one day during a parliamentary sitting. And the only person who stood up was the opposition leader. And um, to, which, to which Tunku said in his usual joking style, oh, we pity you. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, let us all, uh, with, with that uh, reminder from the first Agum and that anecdote from the first Prime Minister, um, let us all work towards reminding our parliamentarians and our fellow citizens of our history with its important liberal moments. Thank you very much.